Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is a first term counselor for the city of Whitehorse, and he's also the president of the Association of Yukon Communities, Counselor Ted Laking. Counselor, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Happy to be here. So, Counselor, I want to start off with the same question I've asked every single political candidate or counselor on the show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Counselor? It's uh, it is a good question. I've been listening to the uh, the series of podcasts. I've been I don't know if I've been overthinking this question or not, but you know, um, my my thoughts always go back to the fact I've always liked solving problems. Um, I'm a very opinionated person, and I, I have uh, strong opinions on what government's doing wrong, and I've always been good at uh, at making that opinion public and. Um, uh, I thought that, you know, now is the time to get the, the hands-on experience and, and put my uh, money where my mouth is, so to speak, and, and start trying to address some of the issues that I've identified over, over my time as just a political observer. And, uh, and so that's where it comes from, is I just, there's a lot that government does that impacts uh, the lives of, of constituents, um, and I want to help make it better. So what happened in 2021? Because you were first elected uh, in your first term uh, in 2021. What was the issue that was pressing to you that you wanted to say, I have an opinion on this and I believe I can actually help move this issue forward, but also address it for the citizens of my community of Whitehorse? You know, it, it all comes back to housing. Um, you know, where the Yukon is, is a, a very, very large territory. Um, there's lots of land. And so I think that a lot of people are shocked to learn, and a lot of people are shocked to learn when they come here, somehow there's a land shortage. Um, and there's a various uh, amount of issues that contribute to that. There's permitting, there's, uh, you know, assessment delays, there's NIMBYism. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The list goes on, and it's you know there's maybe a different twist on it in the Yukon, uh, but there are probably similar issues being experienced in other jurisdictions across the country. But for me, it was just this uh, you know disbelief that we could have so much land, and yet a shortage of of places for people to live. And so that was really what pushed me uh, to get involved. Was I just I wanted to help uh, any way that I could to help deal with the log jams when it comes to permitting, when it comes to the release of land, when it comes to our processes to dispose of land, uh, or even um, uh, to, to get like things like building inspectors to uh, a new home on, on time so that we can give a, a place occupancy and get people moving in. So that's really the, the burning issue uh, that drove me into to putting my name forward. So while we'll talk about the issues that are facing your community later on in the episode, I want to stick to who Councillor Laking is. So giving back to your community, you could have done it in many different ways. You could have done it through nonprofit. You could have done it through uh, 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 community volunteerism, but you chose politics and you chose specifically municipal politics. Was there an idea that you saw municipal politics as sort of the front line of politics that influences and sort of helps people on a day-to-day -day basis compared to territorial politics or federal politics? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that, uh, that there are, as you say, lots of ways to give back to the community. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I've, I've dabbled a bit in, in all of those that you mentioned, volunteerism, federalism, and territorial. Um, I, I mean, I have a, a history in um, uh, involvement in in volunteer boards in the community uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to nonprofits and, and uh, festivals. Uh, but I also spent, um, you know, six years on Parliament Hill uh, working for the Federal Minister of Environment. And so uh, on, on that file, I was also uh, a, a key uh, proponent of, um, of Northern files, particularly territorial files at that level. And then uh, for the last uh, six years, I've been at the territorial level, uh, both uh, in the premier's office. And then after the territorial election in 2016, I was uh, in the legislature offices uh, with the official opposition prior to doing this. So I've, I've kind of, I've dabbled in all levels and, and municipal was the last one remaining to check on the box, but you're right. 
it does have that sort of front line, um, that front line sort of touch on everybody's lives. Uh, you know, it, it's it's sort of like a, a cliche to say that. And I always sort of rolled my eyes when people said that. And and I guess I didn't realize it until last year when we had what I call snowmageddon here in Whitehorse. And just the amount of emails I was getting related to snow removal, it was like, okay, yeah, this is uh, this is a much higher volume of any constituency work that I've ever seen in my over a decade of political experience. And is really rewarding. Um, I particularly like getting back to people. I like calling them. Uh, I, I like just showing up at their their house and they, I'll get like an angry email like, hey, I can't believe you said this. I really want to talk to you. And then 30 minutes later, I'm, I'm uh, over at their place. They're like, whoa, I, I haven't seen anybody respond that quickly before. I was like, well, let's talk about it. Let's see what it is. Maybe I'm wrong. And and uh, I'm, I've, uh, you know, I was, I was drawn to something that one of your previous guests, uh, Mike Savage, said from Halifax, and that is uh, he really enjoyed the fact that municipal politicians, they, their minds aren't made up right away, and, and they're willing to hear people out and change their minds and, and have the debate. And, and I can't agree more with that. Is uh, There's been lots of times where I've said something to council chambers, and I've thought I was the uh, preeminent expert on something, and then I got a phone call 24 hours later from somebody who was listening, and I'm First off, I'm surprised that <laughs> someone was watching at 9 p.m. at night, but uh, I said, well, you know, you make a good point, and uh, I, I wasn't aware of, of that perspective, and, and uh, you're right, uh, I'll, you know, I'll have a, a different view on, on things. So, um, yeah, I, I really like the sort of that, that uh, grassroots sort of feel of municipal politics. So I, I will be up front here. You are the first person on this show who has gone from the political staffer realm to the elected official realm. And I, as of someone as a former staffer myself, I, I saw what politicians go through on a daily basis, particularly on the, on the provincial and on the federal level. But you decided, hey, well, I, I like the constituency work. So let's put my name in the hat. Was there hesitation because of your background in uh, partisan politics that you said, okay, I see what it did to the sort of the stanima and the appetite of the people I was working for. Maybe I shouldn't, or was it always a, I want to give back, I'm going to, and I'm going to throw my hat in the ring and let's see where the chips fall. You know, it's interesting. I'd say Ted Laking of uh, 2010 would have never thought he'd be running for politics, but it was actually my experience of, of doing political staffing for 12 years that did uh, drive me to want to put my name forward. Um, as uh, any political staffer will know, it, the, the issue comes forward, you give your best advice to your, your superior or your boss, say, this is what I think we should do, this is what I think you should say. And, uh, you know, inevitably there's going to be a time uh, here and there where you're like, I, I wish they took my advice or I wish they said it this way. And, and uh, so um, that was part of the driving thing. It's like, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of, of getting frustrated at people for not taking my advice. And now I can take my advice and then take the lumps if it's bad advice or, or not. And, uh, you know, I actually, uh, I, I now seeing it from the perspective of, uh, of the politician who's the one who's accountable with their name on things. Uh, they're the one that takes the heat. They're the one that uh, people get mad at, not the political staff. I, I now understand that perspective as well. And uh, I mean, I have a, a fairly strong and supportive network of, of people from uh, my previous lives that, uh, you know, oftentimes I just, I bounce things off for them before, uh, you know, I do an interview or before I take a position on an issue just to say like, Am I reading this right? And uh, and uh, you know, there's I've been a, quite a few times where I've been told no, <laughs> I'm not reading it right at all, and and been reconsidered my uh, my take on certain things. And so yeah, it's uh, I I think that my experience as a political staffer drove me to to want to um, to deal more directly. So I want to I want to ask about the first time you saw your name on the ballot. Because I can imagine you, you've you gone in, you voted, you're a political person like I am, you voted many times in your life, probably in every election that you're able to. 
But seeing your name on the ballot for the very first time is a unique experience because you you know you're getting at least one vote no matter what, because people will tell you one thing at the door and you've been in an election campaign, so you should know uh, that they will tell you one thing at the door, but elections are elections. So for you, what was that experience like seeing your name on that ballot for the very first time and putting that X beside your name? Well, you're, you're right. Uh, I, I knew I was getting the one vote. I was pretty confident that I had locked up my support. Uh, and I was I was about 90% sure I was getting at least two because I worked on, uh, I lobbied my wife pretty good as well. So, uh, <laughs> but you're right. You never know. And um, I mean, election night, uh, that is that is a stressful night. Uh, as, as good as a campaign is, you, uh, you, you run or uh, as good as you felt you did at the doors or in the debates or anything, you just, you never know. Um, but you know, the, the weirdest part for me wasn't um, my name on the ballot. It was uh, the election signs. And um, I, I'm personally, I don't like election signs that have uh, a face on them. I, I just, I like, like, I'm kind of old school that way. But the person who I had uh, signed up to be my campaign manager insisted that I throw my face on the sign. And I even I was like, well, no, I don't want to do that. And and uh, but I she reminded me that I had agreed that if uh, if I was going to have her as campaign manager, I wasn't going to be political staff for Ted. I was going to be politician Ted. So I said, OK, I'll uh, listen to you. And so driving driving my kids to school every day and seeing uh, my big ugly mug on a sign that was that was a weird one. And, and having my kids, uh, um, classmates recognize me in the schoolyard and, and tell me that they're doing things like, uh, they have a competition on the drive to school to see who could count the most amount of my face and things like that. So that was the weirdest part for me was, uh, is, was having people recognize me that I had never met before. Did you, I, I've got to ask that question because a lot of times when I speak to municipal councillors, you think you know your community, you think you know everyone in your community, especially smaller communities, but in a city like Whitehorse, was it weird to know that people were actually looking at you and going, hey, you're that guy that's on that sign, or you're that council candidate, right? Like you're the guy who's where you're going to be asking for my vote. Was that an odd experience for yourself? Because staffer you are behind the scenes you're not the in the photos you're behind the scenes but as the candidate you are now officially in the scene yeah it's uh it, it's been an adjustment since the election as well because you know you can you be out at a birthday party of your uh one of your kids friends and then all of a sudden a parent is coming up to you to say hey i really like the way you voted on this and i really and i disagreed with what you said on this and it's like Oh hi! Uh, are you you're so and so's parents? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, no, thank you for that feedback. And so that's that's definitely um, been been a strange thing. But I but I do like it. Uh, I am probably a bit of a political addict. Uh, many of my friends will say that uh, if you get me over for for a drink uh, over on the weekend, uh, inevitably I will somehow steer any topic to something political. Um, and so I do, I do really like to talk about it. Uh, and, um, so that's, it, it hasn't really been something that I've been turned off by. In fact, I get kind of invigorated by those on the street conversations with citizens. You are one of the few people in this world who have been able to walk onto the walk into the city council chambers in the white horse and be an elected official. I wanted to go back to that very first time after the election that you walked in and you swore an oath to uphold, sort of do what you need to do. How much of a weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to make sure that you, how you voted, how you spoke in that room was the best for the community? Because I can imagine that there is a weight that you probably, and all councillors across this great country put on themselves that, you're there to represent and spend the tax dollars that your neighbors, your family members are paying into the city to best serve the city. So how much of a responsibility did you put on yourself to ensure that you were prepared, you were educated in the matters that were in front of council, but also ensuring that what you did best move the city forward in a positive manner? 
Yeah, it's, it is certainly something I take very seriously. Um, the uh, I, I spend um, sometimes uh, maybe overkill a little bit, uh, a lot of research time on on the topics that we discuss. I mean, our budget discussions. Uh, I, our, our city staff uh, kind of rolled their eyes the very first budget meeting I was in because I showed up with this 400-page document that had over 400 uh, post-it notes sticking out, uh, dog-eared all over, and I had a question on every single item. And, and so there was, uh, there was definitely some murmuring when I walked in the room with that. And you know, every once in a while, like this year's budget meetings, I, I, uh, I figured out a more efficient way to go about it. Uh, but I did uh, still sort of, uh, I played up to that uh, this time around and I just tossed on a bunch of post-it notes on some empty pieces of paper when I showed up just to, to cause the, the heart palpitations to go up a little bit among city staff. But yeah, I think that that's one of the things that um, um, my colleagues uh, recognize in me, uh, both both uh, as a, a strength and a weakness is that I've I've somehow dug down into some uh, arcane statistics on an issue, and I, I really want to get in the weeds on stuff. And and sometimes I get too far in the weeds, uh, admittedly, but uh, I do really like it, and I think it's really important to to fully dissect an issue and and understand the history on it. And and as you said, like I'm I'm fairly new. I like to. I mean, he's, I'm getting older in years, but you know, I'm still fairly young when when it's uh, relative to other politicians and. And I don't necessarily have the history or the understanding of the context of a lot of issues. Like, as you know, an issue doesn't just pop up overnight. Uh, many times it's been existent for a decade or more. And so trying to figure out uh, why something got the way it is, uh, it's really important. And, and I, I don't like being caught out and, and not understanding that. And you know what, it's, there's a, it's a learning curve and it's happened to me. The lucky thing is, is for me, is that there's some very good and strong incumbents on our council and uh, that have that history and, and they've been more than willing to share that information with me. And, and so that I've received some important guidance, uh, especially uh, some of the times where I maybe am a bit brash and, and go out. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that uh, to answer your question, I, I, I do put an enormous weight on, uh, on being prepared and ensuring that uh, you know, I'm comfortable at the end of the day with the way I voted being sort of in line with my principles and, and in the best interest of the city. You seem like a genuine guy. You seem like someone who is open and wants to talk to people about their issues that they're facing. As a counselor, though, you have to hear from every single one of your residents and then vote in the best interest of the city. And that means from time to time, some issues may be dropped if John's pothole on his street is needs to be repaired, but it's not in the budget or it's not in the timeline to get fixed this year, you have to go out and tell them no. How has that, ha, have you been able to adapt to that, that sort of new thinking that while everyone's issue is important, you at the end of the day, as council, as councillor waking for the city of Whitehorse have to pick and choose sort of who the winner and who the losers are at the end of the day when it comes to the community wide, because you, you can't think of the individual, you have to think of the city as a whole. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, obviously you'd like to, to do and, and fix everything for everyone. Um, I've found um, that people genuinely want to know that, they, that their, rep, their elected representative cared about them and listened to them. And heard them out and didn't just dismiss them outright and so the thing that i found is important is responding to emails uh, responding to uh, text messages or phone calls uh, yeah, you know I, I i told the city to put my personal cell phone on the website because i want to be accessible so i i'm i'm always there and I, I think that people of different political stripes and different uh, uh, sort of perspectives on the city know that uh, I'm open to hearing from everybody. And I think that if you can genuinely show that, so say for your example of the pothole that you know wanted to get fixed, but you couldn't get a fix, you can genuinely show that you advocated or that you looked into it and got reasonable uh, answers to people and you were able to explain what you did. And um, they're, they may not be happy, but they, they certainly appreciate that you tried. 
and um, that that's sort of the the way that I've I've gone is that uh, you know um, you're you're a representative of the people and people just they want you to help navigate what just sometimes a confusing network and spider web of government uh, policies and you know sometimes it's, we find out through a couple minutes of digging or a couple hours of digging that it's not even a municipal issue even though initially I may have thought it was it's sometimes a different level of government and you know I also don't mind uh, picking up the phone or writing a letter on behalf of a constituent to uh, you know another level of government to say hey this issue needs to be addressed and and so that that's I think the best approach that you can do is don't put yourself under any illusions you're going to fix everything that's impossible but uh, as long as you as you try to to be helpful that's what people want you opened up a good uh, segue here because you, like I said in the beginning, you are the front line of politics. You're the ones that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular basis. If their garbage isn't picked up, they'll call you. If their water's not uh, running when they turn on the tap, they will call you. But from time to time, they will come to you with uh, territorial or federal issues that they don't care if it's another level of government. They want you to fix it as their elected official. How do you deal with that? Because you talk about you're going to write a, a letter on their behalf to somebody else or their uh, territorial member uh, elected representative or their federal representative. You can't do that for every single one of your constituents. Sometimes you have to sort of help them along. How do you balance that idea of you're a municipal councillor, but the issues that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis might be a federal or a territorial issue as well. Yeah, you know, the uh, the balance is certainly a good question and one I'm still trying to figure out myself because uh, when I when I jump in the pool, I jump in the deep end and uh, you know, perhaps my work-life balance hasn't <laughs> always been the greatest. And so, um, you know, nine times out of 10, if somebody asks me to to advocate on an issue, uh, you know, as long as as long as it's a reasonable issue and it's you know not something like uh, you know absolutely insane or or hurtful or something like that, then I will I will go and try to get them an answer. And and I've done that uh, with uh, with federal MPs and I've done that with uh, ministers here in the territory as well. Um, I mean, there was an issue that sort of overlapped uh, both territorial and municipal. Uh, boundaries uh last summer and that had to do with uh patios here uh in the uh in the city of whitehorse and it turned out there was some sort of cost prohibitive issue related to insurance with those patios and you know the city didn't really have the funding and so i, I reached out to the, the minister and response that was responsible for economic development at the time and made the pitch to him that this would be a good opportunity to support uh you know, small uh, bars and restaurants in town to uh, participate in the city's patio program. And, uh, you know, despite being of a different political stripe for me, uh, the my relationship with this particular minister it seemed to pay off as his department uh, all of a sudden showed up with uh, some support for the city to help uh, get these bars uh, and restaurants uh, to participate in this program. So that's sort of the, the, six, the, the way that I approach it is, it's important to have relationships. Um, it's important to be reasonable. It's important to show that uh, um, that you are willing to to work with uh, folks uh, across other levels of government, uh, either if they're territorial, federal, or, or First Nation governments, or even uh, across party lines. I want to turn to the city as a whole now. Uh, we, uh, thank you so much for uh, dealing with that segment, but I want to talk about the city. And before I ask the first question, I want to preface this with like I've done with every other uh, municipal councillor. This is a, this is a conversation between councillor Laking and myself. This is not a decision at council. This is not a motion at council. This is his opinion and my uh, conversation with him. Um, so with that said, councillor, in your opinion, we've already talked about it a little bit beforehand, but I want to go in a little bit deeper. What do you believe is the biggest issue facing the city of Whitehorse today as of recording? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's two major issues out there, and it's it's almost like a 1A and a 1B. And, you know, today, as the, the things that are sort of stressing me out as we go through our budget process, uh, 1A would be infrastructure. Um, there's the cost of construction has gone up significantly. 
Um, the, the labor shortage has helped contribute to that. The supply chain issues have helped contribute to that. The pandemic, um, inflation, all of that is contributing to much more expensive um, building of, uh, of major projects. And um, that has been compounded, uh, particularly here in Whitehorse and the Yukon as a whole by climate change. Um, we're seeing uh, significant impacts of climate change here in the city of Whitehorse. We saw uh, a fairly major landslide uh, at the beginning of last summer. It knocked out one of our major roads in the city, uh, blocking off access to the south end of town, causing for a major detour uh, throughout the entire city, it led to traffic congestion, et cetera. But um, the, the, the what ended up happening. I mean, that was an inconvenience, of course, had economic impacts. We've temporarily fixed that. But one of the major issues that has now resulted is that um, one of our sewage lines goes through uh, some of that uh, that uh, cliff face that that uh, had the landslide. And as a result, um, you know, it needs to now be replaced. And I think that the latest estimate, plus or minus 20-ish percent, is about $9 million. And that's $9 million that, you know, let's think about, like, I think our, our current budget, our capital budget is just, just north of $100 million. So, um, you know, $9 million in an unexpected cost, um, when there's no existing funding pots to help support it, uh, that's pretty tough. Um, with inflation and everything as it is, I don't think that anybody wants to be in a position where they, they have to jack up taxes, help pay for these things. And so this is just one, one tiny example, but it's, it, it, they're, they're happening, um, not just uh, there, but we're getting a bunch of those types of issues here in Whitehorse. Uh, we had a water main um, bust about a decade or two early than we thought it would last summer as well. So we're getting a lot of infrastructure sort of coming to the end of the life unexpectedly and, and we need to find money for it. And I know, you know, with my hat on as president of the Association of Yukon Communities, I know all of the communities in Yukon are, are in similar um, boats where the infrastructure dollars that are available federally just aren't, they, they're not keeping pace with sort of the, the infrastructure deficit that exists in the North. And so this is the, the stuff that kind of stresses me and occupies a lot of my time with both my hats on is, is how, do we, how do we help address these issues? So um, I, 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 I hate to ask the, I hate to ask the question that you just asked yourself, but how do you address them? Because municipal. Sorry, I'll, Chris, you just, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. I'll cut this part out. Yeah. You, you still there? So I'm gonna yeah. ask I'm gonna ask the question that you kind of just asked yourself there, because municipal uh, governments, local governments, have to run. Uh, uh, balanced budgets every year. They can't go into surplus. They can't go into a deficit. They have to run balanced budgets. So how do you fix an aging infrastructure problem when you don't have the money without raising taxes for every single person in your community up a crap load of money, a crap load? So how do you do that? Because I think there's a lot of people out there right now who are in the exact same position that Whitehorse is in. Infrastructure is aging, and we don't have any more money to sort of take out of the average resident. Yeah, I know it's it's a good question. Obviously, the North we don't have the economies of scale of some of the larger cities in the country, and really we rely heavily on on our relationship and our partnerships with the. Uh, with other levels of government to 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 be at the table and and provide that support and are they are they at the table and I hate to throw that they, that they have been, question out, um, out but I have to yeah no of course that you they they have been and that's uh, there's there's money there but I think that one thing you'll hear consistently um, from municipal politicians across the north is that they're not it's not enough. Um, you know, for example, one of the most important funds for municipalities uh, across the country, but particularly here in, in the Yukon, is the gas tax fund, or what's called, the, they renamed it recently to the, Canada, the Community Canada Building Fund, or something along those lines. 
um, you know, the total amount that comes to the Yukon out of that, and this is sort of the catch-all, that grab bag, you can put it towards any of your priorities. The total amount for the entire Yukon territory is about $18 million a year to, to pay for sewer, roads, uh, you know, you name it. And so um, it's like some communities are getting less than half a million dollars a year and they're, they're getting, th their expectation is to be able to deliver, uh, you know, a plus frontline standards with that. And, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's in the scheme of things, it's peanuts. And so one of the positions that the Association of Yukon Communities has taken um, is uh, that we would like to see that fund, uh, particularly for the three territories, increase that uh, by at least uh, by at least double, because it's just there's there's no end to these issues. And we're feeling it in the north, and as I said, because of climate change, and uh, that's not going away either. Um, so the question is, housing is a major issue that a lot of municipalities are facing, and Yukon's not different. Whitehorse is not any uh, different. But you mentioned that land is the big issue that you have in Whitehorse that is facing the housing crunch. How do you solve that? So you've been on council for almost a year and a half now, almost oh, actually probably going almost two years now. How do you solve the housing crisis when you don't have the land to expand? Do you have to build up or what is the solution that you're looking at? And this is again, Councillor Laking answering the question, not council. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's, uh, there's necessarily a silver bullet. It's probably more of like a silver buckshot um, because I think that there's there's a bunch of ways to go about this. And you mentioned one of them, it's building up. I'm a strong believer in building up. Um, you know, one of the one of the barriers that that you run into uh, is obviously um, you know, the that sort of mentality of, you know, that we're not a big city, we don't want to look like Vancouver or, or something along those lines. And and fair enough, uh, I, that's nothing that I would be advocating for myself. But at the same time, when we look at issues like uh, um, the cost to deliver services when our city continually expands outwards, when we look at the issues of traffic, uh, when we just continue to go out to the periphery and require everybody to drive a long way, uh, or even with parking as a result, um, you know, one of the the biggest uh, ways to solve this is through densification and uh, building up and, and allowing uh, businesses to have uh, the, the business case to create larger sort of residences in uh, closer to the downtown core. And so that's uh, an area that um, uh, are, and you're right, I, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but I will say that, you know, through our official community plan process that that uh, myself and my colleagues have been working on recently. It's still in the draft phase, but one of the things we put in there was a fairly significant increase to the building heights uh, in the community. So going from 25 meters to 30 meters as the height. And I mean, 35 meters to, to Toronto or Vancouver, that's low, but for waiters that big, um, that, that's a pretty, it's a pretty big shift. And, uh, but I think that it will, it'll be um, super helpful. Another uh, area that I've been advocating for was uh, um, on our zoning bylaws. Now, I, you know, we, my last count, I think we have 40 to 50 different zoning categories. I think that's too many. I think that that makes it difficult uh, for people to, to adjust to add garden suites or, or different types of uh, buildings to uh, help address the housing crisis. And so, that's an area that I'd like to see. And after we're done our official community plan, we'll be jumping straight into our zoning bylaw rewrite process. Uh, but last night at, uh, or two nights ago, I guess it would have been at council, we were notified that that process is expected to take two years. So that's, I mean, that's, that's a, a more of a medium to longer term solution. But, you know, another area that I think is key is, um, is uh, working with First Nation governments. Here in the Yukon, we have a number of uh, settled First Nations that have self-governing uh, agreements, and they are actually the uh, the government in charge of large tracts of land within 
uh, the Yukon and, and in uh, the city of Whitehorse. And so uh, working with them to help them unlock and access their land for different types of development is going to be essential to any sort of proper solution to, uh, to the housing crisis. We, we are living in a time when uh, you mentioned it a little bit there, but I want to talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more in depth, if that's okay. You talk about your bylaw, your land use bylaw, the, the, the amount of uh, policies that are around certain types, 50, I think you said 50, if I'm not mistaken. Does the average person in Whitehorse understand that? Does the average person in Whitehorse care about the land use policy that it's going to take two years or do they just want you to fix it because i've worked in municipal council and i can tell you the average person on the street and i'm saying this out of respect to the people where i used to work they did not care two craps they wanted to build a house and they wanted to build it their way do you do you believe that we need this uh regulation and i say this as much as uh, with respect but do you believe there, the regulation is needed to ensure that there is sort of a cohesive message within the community? It's it's an interesting problem that you identify, uh, and so I'll try to I'll try to answer it in in both saying yes, but also not dismissing the other point of view that you highlighted, and that people just they want to be able to develop and, and help address the crisis. So. So the first part of the importance of a zoning bylaw, 100%, I believe that that is very important. Um, regardless of my opinions on the content of the zoning bylaw, um, and there is there is a lot of content in the existing zoning bylaw that I don't necessarily agree with, and, and I'm sure that there's stuff that's going to be in the new one that I'm going to have a hand in, in writing that I probably won't like either. But all that to say is that doesn't take away from the importance of its existence because in reality, what a municipal government is supposed to do through its zoning bylaw is help, um, help foster relationships from neighbor to neighbor. Um, if it was sort of a free for all where you could just build anything there, do whatever setbacks you wanted, there was no sort of requirement on you to do or meet a certain standard, then, um, that's where you end into a, a bit of chaos where neighbors might start fighting neighbors over, well, you can't do that, and I don't like that, or I don't like the like, way this looks. If you have a zoning bylaw, you, you know in the area that you live what is allowed, what's not allowed, and then people can be held to that standard as a result. And you, you also, I think that people have the right to know when, when they're purchasing a house or they're renting a house or they're starting a business, they know where they're doing this at and when what can happen in their neighborhood. And you know, um, some people want to live out in the country where you know they don't have a neighbor for two miles. Other people love living in a condo. And so uh, but you know you'd be you'd be shocked if you were buying to live out in the country, but then you found out that the place you actually bought was a condo. So I think the zoning bylaw helps bring uh, sort of uh, orderliness to the way a city develops. And so to the other part though, where people want to just solve these problems now and they don't want to just be to kick the can down the road, sorry, we're working on this for three years, is there are other things that can be done in the short term to help uh, fix things. Um, I mentioned uh, permitting uh, earlier. One of the things that we did early on as a council through our last budget was we identified that there were um, uh, capacity issues to do with uh, with the particular branch of the city that issues uh, permits. And so we uh, bolstered their capacity through um, increased budget. And so now um, they're now working towards getting more people there to help uh, streamline processes to get things out in a more timely fashion. Uh, we are working on a project to uh, have electronic uh, tracking of these to make it easier for, for files to be submitted or, or tracked by the private sector. I mean, the problems aren't solved, uh, but the, there's attention being given to them to, to improve them. And so whether or not you'll get be 100% perfect at the end of the day, I don't know, but, but I can say that improvements have happened over the last year. And, and that's uh, certainly one of the things that I, I've, uh, I think is an important focus on is don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and only focus on the long-term, do the short-term as well. 
I have a question, but it's a kind of a first segment question, part part of yeah. uh, segment two. And that is, you have been on council since 2021. You were first elected in 2021. It is now 2023. In your time, tenure as a counselor for the city of Whitehorse, what has been the biggest eye-opening moment for you as an elected counselor? Was there a moment you went, I didn't think this was an issue. I didn't think this was one of these things that we'd be talking about on a regular basis. Or was there a moment that you went, this is not what I expected the job of a counselor to be? Waste management. <laughs> <laughs> a uh, lot the, of counselors the, say that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, recycling and waste management. It's, uh, I mean, in hindsight, obviously, but <laughs> it certainly was nothing. Um, I don't think it's something you think about it unless it's going badly. And so, you know, my experience with uh, with waste management was the, the dump truck coming and, and grabbing our, our waste bin uh, or the recycling truck coming and grabbing our blue bin. But, uh, you know, particularly on the commercial side of things, um, it is something that I hear about a lot. Uh, it takes up a lot of my time. Um, and it's something that the people that are impacted by it care a lot about it and and rightfully so it's uh, it is important uh, what you do with your waste and where it goes and uh and i know that it's 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 not unique to whitehorse either it's a problem i've uh, threw with my hat on with um, the association of yukon communities um when i took that over last may as the president one of the things that i did uh was visit every single community in the yukon and attend a council meeting at every single community and uh, man, it's you hear about it at every single one of those council meetings as well. I, I even went to the communities that uh, are unincorporated and don't have a council. Um, and so they're just sort of led by some prominent members in the community. And oh man, the number one issue there is their waste transfer station. And so it's- Why it's, do you think that uh, is? Why do you think that is an overarching theme in a lot of communities in the Yukon today? Well, because I mean, there's there's obviously sort of the the there's the philosophical aspect of it is that we produce waste as a species, and so uh, essential to our living is figuring out how to do with the byproducts of our living. And so, um, no, and and then from that is nobody wants to live in waste uh, for a number of reasons, health reasons, and animal attractant reasons, fire reasons, et cetera. Uh, and it's a contaminant for the environment as well. And so there's a number of issues that it touches and uh, you know, responsible management of it is as a result important. Um, but you know, when it's, when I hear from communities that are, I mean, for, for example, I'm not sure which part of the country you live in, Chris, but- Calgary. You know, Calgary, okay. So in Whitehorse, there's a community called Mayo and Mayo is about a, a five hour drive from Whitehorse north of it. And they, they have a town council. Now there's another community that's north of Mayo called Kino City. And don't let the city uh, uh, aspect uh, trick you. It's uh, about 30 people and it's about another hour and a half to two hours north of Mayo. Now they don't have a council, but they have a waste transfer station. Um, and so it's where their local community takes their their waste products and then government comes, picks it up and takes it to the, the Mayo area zone. Um, but through uh, a number of reasons, one of them being budget cuts, the territorial government is getting rid of that transfer station. Uh, and uh, I think that the latest I heard is that they're telling the residents that they're gonna have to just drive their waste to the other community. Um, so there's things like that is like when you're telling you know, a senior citizen take a two hour drive in the middle of winter to go dispose of your, your garbage on, on a road that's uh, not a paved road, by the way. Um, then uh, th that's why when people start to care is what do you do with all of this? And, and I think there's a larger question to be had as not, a, not as a municipal politician in the Yukon, not as a Yukon or not even as a Canadian, but as a, as a human, uh, what, what are we gonna do about waste and, and how do we address these issues? Because I, as you mentioned, you're hearing this from other municipal politicians, the waste issues that Whitehorse is dealing with, I'm sure are minuscule in comparison to the waste issues that Toronto is dealing with. So 
So um, it's something that we as, as a society need to really address. When I started this series, I did not think I'd be speaking about waste management as much as I have been, but here we are. Um, <laughs> I, I want to turn to our last segment because I just realized the time and I, I know I told you in 45 minutes and we're just at the 45 minute mark now. And it's kind of my favorite part because as a tourist, as someone who likes to travel, I like to visit communities. I want to talk about tourism in uh, Whitehorse. So, Councillor... Yeah. What are the hidden gems that as a tourist who listens to this show, who we have people from across Canada and around the world listening to the show, what should I do if I come to visit the city of Whitehorse tomorrow? Well, we don't call it the wilderness city for, for no reason. Um, you know, that one of the, the greatest things about Whitehorse is you, like right now, I'm at my house and I'm a 10 minute drive away from a Starbucks or a Walmart. But then I'm 15 minute drive away from a lake that has no houses around it, that you can swim in, that you can fish in, that you can go biking in trails that you know that haven't been touched in years. And it's just, it, it's incredible how quickly you can be away from the, the urban lifestyle. And that is, I think, one of the things that a lot of people that move to Whitehorse really like because if you love the outdoor lifestyle, you just go canoeing. Uh, you can go canoeing right from downtown Whitehorse for a two hour canoe trip. You still be in the city somehow. Um, but uh, then like the local uh, canoe companies, they'll come pick you up and drive it back to your car downtown. So there's just incredible opportunities like that if you're into the art outdoors. But we also have, uh, and this is probably surprising to some, but uh, quite, uh, a very vibrant arts community. You know, one of the, the um, one of the, like the better sort of painters that uh, that I like is is Ted Harrison, and uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen any of his paintings, but they're just beautiful. But I mean, there's we have uh, a local uh, like poet uh, society where they're doing like great and uh, nationally recognized work. Uh, we have um, like we have for a community our size uh, very good quality recreational assets uh, as a municipality i mean one of the greatest players in the nhl right now is from whitehorse dylan cousins on the buffalo sabers and i mean we're like he i think the latest i heard on the news this morning is close to 40 points on the go like he's, he's one of the top point getters this year so that, that's a guy from whitehorse um, we got another up and coming um, NHL prospect as well. And so we're, we punch above our weight here in Whitehorse. And it's because of all of the opportunities that exist for the arts or for sports or for the outdoors. And it's, it's really incredible. We've had a number of Olympians as well uh, from the Yukon. So. What about yourself? After a long day at council, is there a spot in Whitehorse that you go to? You, you've heard this question, I'm assuming, before, if you've listened yeah. to the show before. So what is the hidden gem that you go to? Is there a local watering hole? Is there a park? Is there a little park, uh, a spot by the lake that you go to just relax, decompress, and just let the issues that you've just dealt with for the day melt away? It's, I don't even have to think about it. It's called the Woodcutter's Blanket. It's a uh, local microbrewery here in town. It's uh, a bar that's made out of an old wood cabin. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's my favorite place to go in town. So that's uh, whenever we finish a council meeting, usually a group of us decide to go uh, debrief and have the real, the real meeting at, uh, at a bar. And uh, uh, my lobbying effort is always for the woodcutter's blankets. So that's, uh, that's one of my favorite places. Um, so my last question to this counselor is, what makes the city of Whitehorse such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I think, like I already said, is it's it's got the amenities of Vancouver, but it's a rural town. It's in the it's in the far north. Um, you can go skiing. You can go. Uh, you can go fishing, uh, you know, all, do all these things in a very short order period of time. Um, it's just, it's, it's such a fantastic place. And we have an international airport. We have uh, direct flights to Europe out of Whitehorse. Uh, they just, I don't think that you 
can find anything else like it in the country. It's just, it, it's really incredible. And one of the, the, the greatest opportunities that's uh, coming forward for us is as we get uh, better and better um, internet in the North, we're, I think that we're really gonna become a destination for uh, people to work remotely, um, particularly in the information and technology sector, because we have reliable internet and you know, it's, we provide a quality of life that not, in, not every city in the country or the world can, can provide. So uh, that's what I really like about Whitehorse. And I mean, the other thing that's really unique is, uh, you know, we're, we're only 34,000 people. Um, we know a lot of the people. Uh, and if you, if you don't know them, you will know them. And um, the, I mean, for example, like there's, there's people in the city administration that I graduated from high school with. There's, you know, other politicians that went to the other rival high schools. And, and you know, so there's, it, you know, everybody and you feel like uh, it's a bit of a family and everybody's rowing in the same direction. If maybe they have a bit different of a perspective on how to, how to get to that in that direction. But I think everybody's lo looking out for each other in the best interest of the youth one. Um, counselor, I want to thank you so much for taking the last hour out of your schedule and just sitting down and chatting with me about yourself and your community. As I've said, in 2023, we're doing this whole big tour of Canada and Whitehorse is one of the stops that we will be making. And I will make sure I hit that local brewery just to make sure to see what it's all about and see that wood wood cabin for myself. So I'm looking forward to being up in Whitehorse. Well, this let time. me know when you're here and, what, and I'm looking for any excuse to get there. So. <laughs> Perfect. That's a date then. So we will we will be there and we'll have a follow up interview in the bar. Um, but counselor, oh, there you so go, live from Woodcutter's blanket. <laughs> there you go, uh, counselor. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure to chat with you today. Great. It was it was really good, Chris. I really had a lot of fun. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with the, that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. Have yourself an excellent day. We'll be back tomorrow for another great episode. Talk to you later.